recovery from bipolar. And just, you know, the mum was always looking herself in the room because the medication wasn't quite balanced, because back then we were still getting used to um, what lithium did. So just as you were talking, I was going back to some of those memories of the early career. Um, but I also was the founder of an organization called Mental Health First Aid. We've done a hell of a lot of work around the world. Um, we've trained up hundreds of thousands of people in England on how to spot the signs of mental health and then have a conversation about it. Um, I also, I don't know if you're all familiar with Every Mind Matters platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you get that letter from your GP going, if you need mental health support or uh, some information, go to Every Mind Matters. So I worked with Theresa May's government to set that strategy in motion and get the funding from Public Health England because I was on the board of Public Health England. So my job, um, I'm not a clinician. I work with, now I work with workplaces globally. So our ambition is that every workplace should be good for people's mental health. And I guess one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about workplaces being health-creating environments is that if we can take mental health out of health systems like the NHS, which are overburdened and not reaching us in time, and as Stephen said, these are only able to reach us at crisis points, actually, if we're able to talk about mental health around the kitchen table, in schools, in workplaces, in boardrooms, in line management, then we start to prevent by raising awareness of mental health problems in the first place. And the reason why I'm so passionate about that is um, in my 20s, um, when I uh, gave birth to my oldest daughter, who's now 27, I, I was diagnosed with postnatal depression. And at that time, I had no idea what was going on with me. I just, you know, and I was having, uh, my illness had got so bad that I was actually having psychotic episodes as well. Um, and at that time, being Bangladeshi heritage as well, you know, and actually your point around faith and communities, actually faith healing and communities really stepped in. Mum supported me, auntie supported me. There was a lot of connection to how faith could play a strong part in recovery. <coughs> All of those things helped. Um, medication wasn't great because as a young mum you need energy and medication was making you rather lethargic and we had a conversation with a colleague here earlier about how some people are often over-medicated, again, because health systems aren't doing the right assessments. So you end up being, uh, not living a life of flourishing. Um, so, but one of the things, when med medication wasn't helping, community and family were doing the best that they can. We were all unaware of what mental health was, or mental ill health was. Um, and actually talking <coughs> therapies was not appropriate culturally. So everybody's nodding around the table. You know, a westernized model of culture, uh, talking therapies is often not great for where communities like the diversity in this room, we live in multi-generational households, we have the connection to spirituality, we have a big uh, connection to communities. Actually, the me, myself, talking therapy doesn't often work for us. Um, and, and not to say it doesn't have a place, but it doesn't have the impact that, and the results that we need, and it didn't for me. So what I did was I got a job, and I had the most amazing line manager. We never talked about my family circumstances, my mental health condition, because workplaces talking about mental health back then wasn't a thing. But she recognized talent. She recognized that clearly I was struggling. She gave me encouragement. She built up my confidence. She encouraged me to go back to education. She gave me interesting projects. And actually, she played a much bigger role in my recovery from mental ill health than any health system did. And I was speaking to my colleagues at WHO, Aisha Malik, recently, and WHO have done research now which proves that schools and managers can have a better impact on recovery from mental health than some psychiatric interventions because of the lifestyle element of it. So I guess for me, what, what I, so going back to workplaces, so creating healthy workplaces became uh, a, a, a bit of a passion. I actually only wanted to be an engineer, so I'm completely <laughs> <laughs> 
completely in the in the wrong profession, but I love it. And so we now work with businesses all over the world. Um, Hindustan Petroleum, the Birla Foundation, who obviously played a massive role in sponsoring the eradication of polio, HSBC, Unilever, uh, the financial services, just, you know. In, so we started in the city of London when there was the financial crash back in 2007 and 8, and we saw a significant increase of suicide amongst men. Um, and city businesses recognized that they needed to do something, but they didn't know what to do. Uh, they also didn't want people to say, oh, you know, if a law firm or a bank was doing mental health work, that everybody in that, the stigma was high, and people didn't want the stigma of thinking, well, that law firm's full of mad people, <laughs> or that bank's, well, we might all have our opinions on that, but I think, you know, so there was the stigma that stopped community people talking about it. So what we did is we created an alliance, a community, a bit like the Rotary, but much smaller. Um, and that alliance is now in seven countries. We've got a strategy to have a chapter, as we call it, in every, every country in the world. And we're working with the biggest businesses in the world because our view is that if the private sector, who have got a lot of wealth, who, if they can lean in and not, not give funding to do good for the world, but actually look at themselves as employers and create health-creating environments with human flourishing in mind, you start to have employees who are healthier, but actually through those employees, the education goes into communities. And I'll give you an example. Um, yesterday, I was speaking to my colleagues at HSBC, Archana. Um, she leads the Mental Health and Wellbeing for India at HSBC. It's taken her three years to pull together a strategy for menopause and mental health. And I was just so amazed by what she's managed to do. The first time she did an event for a poor employee, she just invited women because she didn't want to be seen as a radical feminist and that was coming in and ramming menopause down in everybody's throat. <laughs> and she actually, three years on, this, this, this uh, last week, the invitation for the menopause event within HSBC went from one of their male leaders. And the, the part, everybody was invited, plus their partners were invited, plus family members were invited. So the education that she has created to, I think they employ about 20,000 people in India, through the menopause program and women's health is phenomenal. So for me, I think, I think we have to have better health systems, we have to do the education work, we have to create the demand as we were talking a minute ago, Shad, but we also have to think about who are the players that have got the most influence in the world that actually can take the messages out. And employers have a huge responsibility, they're a cornerstone of society, in whichever country we go, whether you're a government sector employer, whether you're a corporate employer, you have a huge responsibility to not just do work that increases, you know, people come to work and traditionally, I think my generation, it was like, well, I'm gonna pay my mortgage this month because I've got a paycheck. But for the next generation, 60% of young people look to see what the employer's diversity and inclusion strategy is look to see what their mental health strategy is before they apply for a job. That's crucial if you want to retain and attract talent. But it's also good on you for the next generation calling businesses and employers out for not just an income that helps them live their lives financially, but being more aware about the environment, <coughs> about the people and elements of the business. So for me, this work that you are doing through the Rotary, and I know that you've got businesses all over the world engaged because of the Rotarians, is that how can we actually leverage health messaging, essential immunization, promotion of the right drugs for mental health, from prevention, intervention, and then also looking at how does the whole population do simple things to keep ourselves mentally healthy? Because you can have a diagnosis, as, Steve, as, um, as, as Simon was just saying, and still flourish. 
you know, and, and everybody that's got a long-term health issue knows that. You can have a long diagnosis and still flourish if you've got connection, if you feel like you're learning, if you look, feel like you're giving back to your community, if you feel like you've got time to pause and notice and take in where, where life is at. If you've got those five ways of well-being integrated in your life, actually you can have the most amazing life and I'm testament to that, you're testament to that and I'm sure other people in this room are. So for us I think we need to reduce the stigma of long-term health conditions by moving it from an illness model into a wellness model and that for me is anybody with a diagnosis can actually live a, live a very healthy life and sometimes people don't understand that and I think workplaces can play an extremely strong role in making sure that that message gets through for stigmatised issues such as mental health. Um, but I'll stop there, very happy to be here, thank you for inviting me and um, yeah, uh, back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 